hidden in the hollers of eastern Kentucky, lives a man of passion and heart, a documentary photographer whose photos focus on the storied lives of those around him. This is his story. I'm Jason French, curator of collections at Barringer Crawford Museum. At our museum, we strive to preserve the cultural history of our region. And though Malcolm Wilson's cultural roots are deep in Appalachia, his education and early career were here in Northern Kentucky and they helped develop him into the photographer we see today. We were fortunate enough to be able to follow Malcolm as he started a new documentary series called Picking on the Porch. Uh, another going to Ohio story. Uh, these guys from Leslie County, Young Bucks, they crossed that bridge, you know. Across the Ohio River, they kind of waved back and said, Goodbye, good old USA. <laughs> 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 what, what, what do you want to play? Okay. As we observed Malcolm, both dodging free-range chickens, but also working with such focus and dedication, it was obvious to us that his eye and heart were on the care and dignity of a subject matter. this thing that I don't take photographs. I make photographs. Appalachia has been taken from for so many years and when I make your photograph I don't want to take something from you. You know, Native Americans always didn't like photography because they thought photography was taking their souls or their spirits or something mm -hmm. away from them. And I don't want to take, I want to make and I want to give. You know, there wasn't TV and things like that. And we've got a lot of things later in life than people in urban areas got. And so after dinner, a lot of the family members would go out on the porch, right out in the yard, and they'd play and dance and sing. So it, it's sort of like history repeating itself with COVID, where people are spending a lot more time again playing music on the porches. For me, that's what I've always done. It's just been, it's about people and my landscape work and, you know, some still life work or other kinds of work that I do serves as a placeholder for what Appalachia is about, where these people live, where I live. And hoping that people outside of Appalachia start understanding Appalachia a lot more than they do. Let's get away from this sensationalism. This is real. This is, these are the real lives and real people working hard to, in some very, very rugged, rugged terrain. I use the word hillbilly patiently. I'm a hillbilly and I'm proud of it. Uh, but you let a northerner call me a hillbilly and I might get offended by that. Malcolm and his wife Amy had invited us to their home in Blackie, Kentucky, where he was working on another project. I couldn't visit Eastern Kentucky without an instrument. Malcolm asked me if I would like to pose with my wildwood dulcimer. Unplanned and unexpectedly, I was no longer observing Malcolm, but he was observing me. For his Humans of Central Appalachia project, Malcolm had planned to do an interview with his friend Tim Wright, the most photographed man in eastern Kentucky. 
Okay, tell me your name and spell it for me, please. Uh, Timothy Gilbright. Right. T-I-M-O-T-H-Y-G-I-L-B-R-I-G-H-T-W-R-I-G-H-T. Okay, and where were you born? Seco, Kentucky. Um, what, what was, where's Seco? Tell me about Seco. Uh, Seco was an old coal camp back in the days, uh, Southeast Coal Company, and my grandfather was, uh, their, their doctor at the Seco coal mine and at the coal camps there. I was raised in a drive-in. Uh, my dad ran and operated a, the drive-in there in Whitesburg, the Alindan drive-in, which was his sister, my and aunt. What was it like growing up around and in a drive-in? Well, it was interesting to say the least. Uh, this was sort of a unique drive-in. They had uh, one of the first of its kind. People come from all around to look at it because as opposed to just being the drive-in, it also had a walk-in section. That my dad, most of the time, he'd go to Cincinnati and get these films, and they'd send back big books of, of just all the, the actors and their signatures on it. I don't really think they'd actually yeah. signed it, but it's a replication yeah. of that. But right. uh, some of them were photographed, and some of them was portrait style. Uh, they always had the people that was sneaking in. That was a thing in the back. So when he'd come out, and he'd look over and make sure everything's running properly and he'd taste the popcorn. So that's not enough salt, not enough ice in the in the uh, pops yeah. for revenue, you know. So the saltier and then more ice in your pops and therefore you have to buy more uh, pops for sure. Huh? He said ice don't cost nothing. <laughs> But, I mean, we did the last movie I think we had was a 007 movie, James Bond, which brought in pretty good revenue. Yeah. But that, that, like I said, the, the TVs had killed the drive-in out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, just more affordable, even though it may only been 25 cents to get in. Yeah. Now it's nostalgic. Drive it's in. nostalgic. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I go to as many that's still open. And, right. Yeah. Malcolm's next interview was with someone near and dear to his heart, his wife Amy, who is a nurse practitioner. Okay, tell me your name and spell it, please. My name is Amy Asher Wilson, A-M-Y-A-S-H-E-R-W-I-L-S-O-N. And Amy, where were you born? Brevard, North Carolina. Well, Brevard, North Carolina mm -hmm. is not really in Appalachia, is it? No. But... Your roots are in Appalachia. Right. So let's start there. Let's start by talking about your Appalachian roots uh, with your grandparents. My grandparents are from Letcher, Kentucky. Are right, these your paternal or maternal? That would be my paternal. Mm -hmm. Maternal also from Perry County, which is Appalachian. Okay. Tell me about uh, those, your grandparents from Letcher County. They uh, ran a little country store with a little custard stand and the post office. They were the center of the town of Letcher. No stop signs, no nothing. Just a little town. But and they had the uh, what they call a commissary. And my grandfather had deep, was deep, deep miner as well. So he was in the mining business. Right. Mm -hmm. So he had his own coal camp. And I remember, I mostly just remember the coal train one by the house when I was little. Yeah. And I would shake the whole house. He had a little chair for me to sit and watch the train go by. Yeah. Which is very frequent back then. Right. Who are you most like, you think? My daddy. He was a neurophysicist. Mm -hmm. And they say that we're dumb hillbillies. That's what I just don't understand that. You right. Know, I really don't. And mother was the oldest of ten. And they all went to Stuart Robinson, which which, which was a good start. Mm -hmm. And um, and her dad was a minor too. But my point is, all of them came out educated and made something of themselves. And they were just born in, in a little coal camp right out there at Ajax and Hazard. So yeah. then I went away to college. Um, I went one year at Berea, one year at Warren Wilson in North Carolina. And um, I kept thinking, 
I would just stay gone. Uh-huh. But it just seems like you get drawn back. You get, you know, just like Daddy, you get drawn back in. Right. And then eventually it just it started feeling like home and I, I never left. Right. The draw of the mountains is something that Malcolm and I spoke a great deal about and what it was to be a proud Appalachian. When I was about six years old, my dad had a, like I told you, he had a garage. Had this guy that worked for him. I'm going to change his name to protect the innocent. So we're going to call him Theodore. Theodore worked for my father, and he got a job in Louisville at GE. Six weeks later, they came back to town. Six weeks, short six weeks. And mom and dad invited them to our house for dinner. And they came in, and I know, you know, me and my brother knew Theodore and his wife and knew, um, you know, they came to the house for dinner, and dad was a real good employer to all of his employees. And and he grew up in Harlan County, you know, he's he's off the rest of us. Well, when he came back to dinner after working in Louisville for six weeks, he and his wife were talking like this. And they had changed their accents. And they were pronouncing every syllable. And I'm, I'm not wanting to say something at the dinner table. My dad is pinching my leg. Because he knows that because they're doing this, I'm going to say, you know, what happened to Theodore's voice, you know? And I'd start to say something, and dad would pinch my leg all through dinner. So they finally left, and I had to ask dad. I said, dad... What's happened to Theodore and his wife? Said, they don't talk right. And dad sat me down and said, son, you, you're gonna, I'm gonna teach you a lesson. Said, there are a lot of people who are not proud that they came from here. There are a lot of people that are not proud that they came from the Appalachian Mountains. So what they're trying to do is hide where they came from. He said, don't you ever hide where you come from. We sat down with Malcolm to explore his origins in photography in high school when he was 17. I was the president of the Beta Club. I was a nerd. (laughs) And I uh, convinced our sponsor, uh, one of my high school English teachers, who, who sponsored the Beta Club, that the Beta Club needed a camera to document all the things that the Beta Club was doing. And um, we went to Louisville to the national or the state beta club convention. And there was a camera store in Louisville called Gatchel's. And he and I went down to Gatchel's and used beta club funds to buy this Argus 35 millimeter camera Mm -hmm. uh, from Gatchel's in Louisville. And uh, I started first documenting what the Beta Club was doing. I started right there with that convention. That's one of the first things we did when we got to Global's by that camera. And we had a, a a girl we were running for one of the state Beta Club offices or something. So we had all this campaign and all this stuff we were doing. And then I started documenting um, things around high school. You know, just all kinds of things going on. This was my junior year. Um, well, my senior year, that I was put on the yearbook staff. And it was the first year in the history of Cumberland High School where they did not hire a professional photographer to photograph the yearbook, other than the, the regular formal portraits right. you know, of, of the classes. But all the other activities, I photographed. So uh, that was my first documentary work, was documenting my senior year in high school. But I was a nerd, and girls didn't like nerds very well. And then all of a sudden, when I started photographing the yearbook, every girl in high school was my friend. <laughs> I was sort of getting into that. You know? People talk about education in Appalachia and say, you know, it's, we're dumb hillbillies, and, you know, the, the schools are terrible and everything. 
I would not trade my education for any education, any, you know, elementary or high school or even college for any other place in this country. Uh, because the th things that made me do what I'm doing today are because of teachers. Teachers don't get, a, get enough credit. Uh, one of the first teachers to affect me was I was in the seventh grade in a social studies class. And um, his name was John Brewer. And he was talking about Appalachia one day. That was the topic we were sort of studying Appalachia. And he said, the problem with Appalachia is that all the good people leave. And that stuck with me since the seventh grade. I got a scholarship out of college to be an engineer. In the UK, full ride. I was in a calculus class, an advanced calculus class that meant four days a week. And it was on a Thursday, and this calculus professor came in, and he had worn the same shirt, tie, pants, everything, for four straight days. And you could see, he was an old German guy, and you could see everything he had eaten all week. There were stains on his shirt. Mustard stains, egg stains, ketchup stains, you know. And all of a sudden, I tuned out calculus. Started thinking about, if I only had a camera, I could photograph this man. Because it, he's so interesting, and it's so visually interesting. And I was sitting there in calculus class, and I said, I don't want to be an engineer, I want to be a photographer. And it, something snapped in my brain that day. And I got my books, and I walked out of class reneged on my scholarship that was excited at first that I'd made this life decision. One of my right. first adult life decisions, you know, that somebody else didn't make for me. And uh, then all of a sudden I thought, my dad's going to kill me. I just turned down this full ride scholarship. He's going to kill me. And he said, son, if you're not going to go to school, you're going to have to do something. He said, so you should apply for this job as a repairman for Sears. And I got real excited and I applied, but not for the reasons my father thought. The reason, two reasons, I knew it was very easy for an employee to get a Sears credit card. Oh. Number one. Number two, at the time, Sears had an amazing camera catalog. They sold Hasselblads and Nikons and darkroom equipment and everything. And they had a separate catalog just for photography. So I said, I'll get me, a, I'll go to work for Sears, I'll get me a credit card and I'll get me a camera. Which is exactly what I did. And my first camera was a Minolta uh, SRT202, I think is what it was called. 35mm film camera. And I took it with me. When I go up hollers to work on appliances and started documenting Appalachia. So I started out in 1978. I quit my job at Sears and went to Southeast Community College, which was community college there in Cumberland, to get my basic classes in. I had a professor who now is retired and lives in Lexington and a poet named James Good, who I took an Appalachian studies class under. And we had to do these special Appalachian projects. And People were doing things like making molasses or quilting or, you know, these traditional Appalachian things. I said, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm about. I want to take photographs. And I brought some in to show him. And he sort of did backflips. And he said, yeah. So my first actual photo exhibits were for that class. Uh, one was called Weathered Faces of, of Older People. And the other one was called Young Blood. It was teenagers and you know people younger that lived in my hometown and uh, so he had a big effect on me and he encouraged me and he ended up hiring me they had an archive and I hired, he hired me while I was going to school to work in that archive and print for him so I learned a lot of dark room work and things like that so he had a major effect on me then in 1981 we uh, finally settled on Northern Kentucky University, and we moved up there in August of 81. One of the reasons that I chose Northern, I went and I met with different department heads, and I felt like these other schools that I visited 
were going to change the way I saw. I didn't want somebody to change the way I saw things. I wanted somebody to pressure me and polish mm -hmm. the way I see things. And I only got that vibe from Barry Anderson. And I was right. He didn't change the way I saw things. Whereas some of these other people look at my work and, well, this don't really fit into the way, you know, but da-da-da, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, he's a, Barry Anderson's one of my heroes. Back in northern Kentucky, we spoke with Barry Anderson. Yeah, I had the pleasure of working with Malcolm for uh, about three years, I guess. Malcolm was uh, a non-traditional student in that he was old, older than 22. Um, but uh, hardworking from the get-go. I mean, Malcolm knew what he wanted to be. Um, he defined himself as a hillbilly boy from eastern Kentucky. Uh, and I'd ask him how he was doing, and he was fine as frog hair. So Malcolm professed an interest in documentary work. The work that uh, Malcolm does, especially with the Appalachian Project, he, he couldn't do that work if he wasn't of it. Uh, you know, he knows who those people are, he respects them, he knows how to talk to them. And when you look at his photographs of that, you can see that. You can see his respect and understanding of the people that he's photographing and uh, recording stories from. The picture structure itself, it's a little like tuning a musical instrument and it, it, you know, it can play more beautifully if it's visually tuned than, than not. Uh, so those are some of the things that you, know, you try over a period of time. And like a lot of things, it, it's time and pushing the button a lot. You know, there's an adage that I can't remember who to attribute it to, that if you, you want to be a better photographer, push the button more than anybody else does. You know, you take a lot of pictures and you look at a lot of pictures and you try and think about, you know, why is this better? Why does this work? Why is this a, a good, strong photograph and this one not so much? A lot of my projects, student projects in photography at Northern, I've come to the mountains and did them. Uh, documentary projects and things like that that were, you know, part of my studies. I would, uh, I would come down here and make photographs. So my heart's always been here. So all of the people I photograph, there's interaction between me and them, and I get to hear their stories. And with street photography, you don't get to hear those stories. You don't get to know those people. And uh, sometimes the stories are long, and I'm, I'm not just talking about the stories where I record people for the Humans Project, but I'm talking about just my straight documentary photography, where I'm out walking the streets or going into shops or wherever to, to, to photograph people in Appalachia. Um, I always get, I take with me a little piece of them, not just visually, but emotionally, and I get to take away uh, things that I didn't know about them. And sometimes the things are amazing. And in just short conversations, you can learn a lot if you just teach yourself to listen. And a lot of the stories that, that I hear, especially the recorded stories for the humans, a lot of those stories, uh, people will tell me things that, like I said, I'm, a lot of times I'm shocked that they want to share that information. But, you know, there are issues everywhere. We have drug issues in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and... There are many stories of people that have told me how they overcome those those problems and were were addicts or alcoholics or uh, were abused in some way as children or you know just all kinds of things and some of them have just been gut wrenching that uh, stories and some amazing people how they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got out of some bad, bad situations. And there's also triumphant stories. Those are triumphant stories, mm -hmm. but there are also other kinds of triumphant stories of success and, you know, and, gr and there's stories of grief and, and just all the things that make us human. Right. And, uh, but in my context, it's Appalachian humans or humans of central Appalachia. 
you know, you've heard the old saying, every person has a story. Well, I'm going to take that one step further and say every person's story, every person's story is important, historically. Every single human being's story is important. So Malcolm, we're here on the, the side porch, the pergola of the bungalow, and in the bungalow you have a little gallery of, of your images and, and some of your photography here, and it's, it's been striking while staying here as I just find myself attracted to certain images, and what we wanted to do is I just pulled some of them off the wall, and while you're here, I was going to ask you kind of the story behind each of these images and kind of get your your uh, background on them. Okay, that's wonderful. So the first one is this one here. This um, was shot uh, after I left the post. I worked uh, in a commercial photography studio in Cincinnati. This was taken during my time there. This lady's name is Zoe Thompson. Uh, Zoe was my photo assistant for a while there while she was going to UC. And she was studying uh, theatrical makeup and wig making and all that college conservatory there at UC. Mm -hmm. And um, she would want to try these makeup things out or wigs that she had actually made herself. And uh, we would make these photographs. So we started making photographs. Uh, based on old Hollywood movies and old Hollywood movie actors from the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 30s, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoe was actually a brunette. She was British. She was from uh, England. And um, she actually made this wig. She did the makeup herself. Uh, and this is just one of that series. And this is sort of a Marilyn Monroe kind of look thing that she wanted to do. And there's a whole series of these photographs that we did during her tenure there. Anytime we had free time, we would work on this project. Um, Zoe ended up going to Hollywood, as far as I understand. Got married, got kids, got a lot of credits, and a lot of major motion pictures now. Oh, wow. Um, I think uh, Little Man Tate was her first credit. Okay. Um, she did the makeup for Little Man Tate. That, that film, but uh, she was also involved in a league of their own when they filmed that, and then I sort of lost track of Zoe, but a lot of fun. This girl was just a blast, absolutely hilarious. Well, it's a great image, and it just, it was, it, it stands out as a little different than the others here in this house, so we had to ask about it. It just was, it was curious. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a studio photograph. Right. So the next one we have here is this amazing one with the accordion. Oh, this was one of my great friends, Jim Webb. Jim Webb is an Appalachian icon. He's an Appalachian legend. Uh, he's a poet. He's a radio was a radio personality. Uh, he has a place up on top of Pine Mountain that we will actually pass on our way to Harlan County called Wiley's Last Resort, which it was this place he put on music festivals, art fairs, things like that. Um, uh, it was sort of Letcher County's Woodstock kind of place. Um, and uh, I'd go to a lot of music festivals and other events that he had up there. Jim passed away in October of 2018 of pancreatic cancer. Uh, but this is at one of his events. Uh, he really wasn't playing that accordion. In fact, I think somebody said he's holding it the wrong way <laughs> um, in this picture, but he liked to goof off. He had a great sense of humor. And uh, he's uh, well-known in Appalachian writer circles and poetry circles. Uh, uh, he has a lot of friends in greater Cincinnati. Uh, Pauletta Hansel, who was Cincinnati Poet Laureate recently. Um her roots are here, and he and her were good friends. So, But it was heartbreaking to lose such a legend in this region. And a place will never be the same without Jim Webb. 
Well, it's, a, it's a wonderful image, uh, and you can kind of see how much of a character he is in it. Too. He is. Uh, they broke the mold when they made Jim Webb. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a good looking image. This particular uh, pop up studio I did at a place called Carcassonne Community Center. Mm -hmm. Carcassonne Community Center is the longest running. Uh, square dance in Kentucky and maybe in the United States. I don't know. But since the pandemic, they've not been doing square dances. Right. But it's only, it's right here on top of the mountain where we're sitting. It's Parker's own community center. Well, this woman in Hazard brought her mother to be photographed. Her mother and her father, this woman and her husband, were um, very prominent citizens of Perry County, business people. They had their own private plane. They would fly places. Mm -hmm. And she brought a photograph. Her husband had passed away. She was in her 90s when I made this photograph. And she brought a photograph of her and her husband. So this is her. I thought that might be this her. This is her, and this is her late husband. Uh, this is one of, uh, again, <laughs> another jewel in this series of pop-up studios that I, I just really love. And uh, she was still a proud and elegant lady in her 90s, just like she was in this photograph of her and her husband. So when I ask people to bring something important to them to be, to be photographed with, you never know what's going to show up. Sometimes it's their kids. Sometimes it's, how did a guy bring a weed eater? It was important to him because since the bust in the economy in eastern Kentucky... He was a carpenter, and now that weed eater is important. That's how he makes a living. So he brought that weed eater to be photographed with. So it's amazing what things people bring to be photographed with. But for her, she brought a picture of herself and her husband, and I just, I just really love this photograph. Social media has turned photography and a lot of other things into sound bites. Uh, you know, I post a lot of my work on social media. I probably do more of that, sharing it with people than other people because I've got a message about Appalachia that mm -hmm. I want people to see and, and talk about and think about. But with a print on the wall, a matted print, you actually get, it, it, it's not a sound bite anymore. You become very personal as a viewer. Ansel Adams said, no matter... What the subject in a photograph, there's always two people in every photograph you look at. The photographer and the viewer. Okay? Uh, and I think that holds more true with a print than it does social media. You know, we're shooting, I think, a trillion photographs a year in this country. Oh, yeah. A trillion photographs a year now because of all the technology and phones and all that. And in some ways, that's good. And in some ways, I think it's bad. Because everybody thinks they're a photographer now. The message has gotten deleted. Newspapers have gotten rid of their photo staffs. And photography has become mediocre at best. Mediocre across the platform. Uh, and I went to college. I paid my dues. I've, you know, I've... 250,000 negatives in my collection before I switched to digital and, you know, probably more than a half a million digital photographs in my collection. Uh, I've been shot at. I've been beat up. I got beat up in Newport by a car dealer one time. Really? Covering a story for the Post because somebody was protesting in front of their dealership that they got a lemon. And they had a thug come out and beat me up. So I paid my dues. <laughs> Um, I know what it feel or sounds like. It also in Newport to hear a bullet go by your ear that had your name on it in a hostage situation in Newport. Um, I struggled in college. I ate soup beans and Ro Roman Raymond noodles, you know, to get through school. I mean, we struggled, and I paid my dues. There used to be an old saying in the newspaper business as a photojournalist. You're only as good as your last assignment. I don't agree with that. You're only as good as what you show. And that's my philosophy. Now here I am. 
This has been a special project for us as we explore and, and observe a man at his, at his chosen occupation, his, his passion. You know, I've learned so much in this process. As Malcolm said, you know, he doesn't take photographs, he makes photographs. He said that so many times in, in people in the past felt that if a, their photograph had been taken that it took something from them. Uh, and he doesn't ever want to take from people that he feels that have already been exploited, that have already been taken from. And as I observed Malcolm doing what he does best, it occurred to me that he doesn't take from people. With every photograph he makes, he's taking something from himself. We're seeing not him taking someone's soul and, and putting it in a photograph. We're seeing him take from his soul and in every photograph he, he makes, we see a little bit of Malcolm. The Appalachians, we pull her, you know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and just, as a friend of mine says, get on with it. You, know, you just got to get on with it. Whatever life feels you, you get on with it. You told me a story once. I want you to tell me that story about the elephant. Oh, the elephants, I don't know about Statue of Limitations or whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, You're good. <laughs> <laughs> it was a particular carnival in there one year. Of course, they had an elephant, and you could ride the elephant. So Finally, the big old elephant, after all day long of touring the people around in this, basically a circle. I guess it's trainer, keeper, poking it a little bit too much, I thought pitchfork and such. Yeah. I said, that ain't right. No water. Yeah. So I devised an idea to free this elephant. So they had two shackles on it, so I guess it, but I, I've got the one off pretty good. It may or may not have drank my slow gin and I mucked up. <laughs> it walked from here to that tree over there to a cotton candy stand, which all that sugar was in there, and God, it, it ate and ate and ate that sugar. So here I'm trying to get on the tongue of the trailer, you know, cotton yeah. candy and candy apple. It was getting its, getting its sugar fixed. Yeah. And I'm trying to get on the tongue of that to get on it. I could not mount and ride the thing out. I'm sure I could once I got on it. I now, could how, ride it. how far were you going to ride it? How far is it from I, As I said, I never, other than getting it, Freed from its captors or to, was my, my thought. Ran, ran all the way to the river. Yeah. And next thing I know, that big old elephant down there, it was having a heyday. I heard the crunch, 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 I guess going through the weeds and trees. Yeah. Got in the river and it was sitting there, brrr, brrr, drinking its, its gullet full and blowing the, its trunk in the air, just like yeah. what you see on TV and such. Man, I better get out of here. So I went back down to it and I said, Man, what's going on? He said, The elephant's got loose. <laughs> so you returned to the same Oh, place. almost definitely, you know. And he said, The elephant's loose. It's in the river. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, What are you doing here? I said, Well, all the commotion I heard. <laughs> so they did catch the elephant. I believe they did up to call the fire department, police, and <laughs> quite big activity. And as I remember well, it was in the front page of the mountain either. <laughs>